A blessed Good Friday to all of you. We have just heard, read, the passion of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ from the Gospel of St. John. You did not hear all seven of them today, but traditionally we consider seven last words spoken by Christ from the cross. First, Jesus makes a plea for mercy for his persecutors and calumniators. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Next, he makes a promise to the good thieves, Dismas. Today you will be with me in paradise. Third, he gives the great gift of his mother to us to be our mother. Woman, behold your son. Behold your mother. Fourth, he cries out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Next, he states his unquenchable desire that souls follow him. I thirst. Sixth, he announces that he has completed the sacrifice. He has done what he came to do. It is finished. And finally, he gives up his life. No one took it from him. He gave it up freely. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Now, much has been written about these seven last words. I do not plan on preaching on all seven of them today. But let us consider the fourth word of Christ. Maybe puzzling for those who lack faith or who have no faith. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? These are actually the opening words of Psalm 22. Is this merely a cry of dereliction? Is it a cry of hopelessness? It sounds like it. When you read through the rest of Psalm 22, you think about some of the other dark passages, the other dark verses found there. But I am a worm and no man, scorned by men and despised by the people. Many bulls encompass me, Strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. And who can forget verses 16 and 17? They have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. Reflecting on these, particularly the opening line, but other lines from Psalm 22, has led some scripture scholars in the 20th century to pose the idea that Jesus, Jesus Christ, true God and true man, suffered a crisis. Rudolf Bultmann, a famous German scripture scholar, said this, we may not veil from ourselves the possibility that Jesus suffered a collapse. When I read that, something that struck me, and I respect many scripture scholars, there are some great ones, although there are some who have led people astray, maybe through building their own intellectual and technological, educational babbles, but those who simply have lost faith in Jesus, they have lost the fact that Jesus Christ is true God and true man. And it is greatly arrogant and very pride-filled to think that we can sit in the 21st century, or in the case of Bultmann, the 20th century, and look back, ignoring 19 centuries of Catholic and Christian people who believed and practiced their faith with prayer, fasting, and almsgiving, and suddenly, because he was plopped into the 20th century, to think that oh, well, now I have the fullness of truth, and I, because of my study, I can say this, that Jesus had a collapse, that Jesus doubted. It's it's a frightening thing, a little bit of learning. Some people are educated beyond their intelligence because what it can lead us to, our pride can lead us to reject the fact that Jesus is Lord. We can become more proud of our own works, and we will reject the author of our salvation. And through this study and through all of this learning, 
of, and there, again, there's many good theologians, good philosophers, good scholars, but when you get off the path, when you forget who Jesus was and what, it's quite simple. Jesus Christ, true God and true man, came to save us from sin. When it becomes inconvenient to remember the past, it comes, becomes inconvenient to remember what he did for us. Because if you can kind of talk yourself into believing that he doubted, then you can talk yourself into rejecting many of the teachings that he left us in the Beatitudes, in the commandments. You can reject that he is the Son of God, and that's precisely why he was crucified. I mean, it said it in the Gospel again today that the Jews crucified him because he said, I am, because he claimed to be the Son of God. They didn't go around crucifying just anyone. There were others who claimed to be messiahs, but there were, those others did not claim to be divine messiahs. Those others did not claim to be the Son of God, as Jesus claimed. And as we see, as we will see on Easter Sunday then, he came, came good on that promise that he would rise from the dead. So the argument that this opening line of Psalm 22, Jesus saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That Jesus suffered a collapse, it's an insufficient argument. It doesn't, it doesn't stand up. Because what you have to think about is how a first century Jew would have heard those words when Jesus spoke that cry of pain from the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? They would have heard that, and it wouldn't have just brought to mind the, that line. It would have brought to mind all of Psalm 22, the, the dark passages, but also the light passages, the passages of hope. To, to say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It, it's, it's just, it, it brings that, that whole thing to light. It's like if we were to say, uh, when you say the line, the band of brothers, what does that, that, that reminds us of a, the, the, the miniseries from HBO and maybe the Henry V play and the brotherhood that was built up by soldiers in combat. More appropriately for us as Catholics, when you say the, the, the words, very taught a splendor or humani vitae it evokes the whole of the teaching of that particular document that papal document or that vatican document and so it really gives us a, a fuller understanding of, of what you know if you call someone a, a humani vitae catholic or a very taught a splendor catholic they're really they're hardcore and in jesus then saying my god my god why have you forsaken me? Invoking that Psalm 22. He's speaking from pain, but he's also pointing forward in hope. Listen to some of the hopeful verses. He says, Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none else to help. If Jesus is so despairing, who's he calling on? Why is he asking for help? Is there some trust there? The psalm goes on. For he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, and he has not hid his face from him, but has heard when he cried to him. Who heard? Well, God heard. God hears the cry of the poor. And very significantly, verse 26, 27, 28. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied, those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nation shall worship before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. The psalmist is talking, pointing ahead to a kingdom. Now, the psalmist may have been talking about an earthly kingdom, but Jesus, in invoking Psalm 22, he wants to establish more than an earthly kingdom. He wants to establish a heavenly kingdom, the divine kingdom. He's, he's pointing ahead to what he will establish in his church. He wants to draw all nations into his church. And think about what happens immediately after Jesus died. And he's hanging there on the cross, and they've broken the legs of Dismas 
and justice, but they don't break the legs of Jesus. He's already dead. And so what does Longinus do? He reaches up with that great spear and pierces his side. And out flows blood and water. Very significantly, blood and water. St. John Chrysostom draws attention to the fact that the water points towards baptism, the means by which we become the adopted sons and daughters of God. The blood, which is the Eucharist, which nourishes us spiritually. And Jesus has done this for us, drawing and giving all nations, giving all nations, not forcing it upon us, but calling us to himself to become members of his mystical body, to become members of the church. The faith that Jesus is calling us to is a faith very different from what the Pharisees lived out. Jesus actually collects the, the blind, the lame, the addicted, the broken, those who are struggling physically, emotionally. Jesus says this line from Psalm 22, so that we will not be afraid to suffer, so that we will not be afraid to enter headlong into any pain or suffering that he might allow to enter into our lives. Each of us at some point encounters a personal Golgotha, a personal suffering. And Jesus Christ, true God and true man, went there before us and he sanctified suffering. He gives suffering meaning. And so, especially in the church, we can unite our sufferings to his, and he will receive our sufferings when we offer them to him, when we bring them to the altar, he will receive these offerings as a sweet oblation to draw us more deeply into union with himself and with the Father and the Holy Spirit. And as Catholics, we have been given those great gifts in the sacraments, especially in the Eucharist, in baptism. And so on this Good Friday, as we meditate on those words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God did not forsake him. Jesus did not think that he was forsaken. And we in our sufferings, we can, we can it's okay for us to say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So long as you don't forget that God has given us the cure for our ills. He has given us the cure for our suffering. In that relationship with Christ, especially uniquely in the church, and in the sacraments that he has given us. And we will be purified, and we'll, we will be drawn to him if we offer to him our sufferings and our prayers willingly. Praised be Jesus Christ, now and forever. Amen.